So when I was talking to the organizers about uh, doing this talk and about the, about the conference in general, this is a slightly different conference audience than I'm used to speaking to. There's more of a mix of different skills and, and different interests here. Um, so from what I understand, there's a mix of developers, architects, and even a few business folks here. So with a diverse crowd like that, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this talk is going to have something to disappoint everyone. So hopefully the business folks won't be too put off by the fact that I'm going to show some code. And hopefully the, tech, the developers won't be too, too put off by the fact that, honestly, this is probably the least technical talk I've ever done in my life. But hopefully still interesting. Um, so as you, know, as you know, I'm the language architect for Java at Oracle. And part of my job is deciding on the right direction for Java's evolution to take. And to help me make those decisions, I have a helpful community of 9 million developers with probably 12 million opinions. And if any of you have spent any time on the OpenJDK mailing lists, you know they're always willing to share those opinions in a very polite and well-reasoned way. So hopefully this talk, in you know, addition to being maybe a hopefully interesting history lesson and hopefully not too blatant a sales pitch, uh, will help you understand how Java got to where it is and how we chart the direction for where it's going. And for those of you who love programming in Java, I hope that this will be an inspiring tale of rebirth and renewal. For those of you in the business of competing with Java as a programming platform, hopefully it's a little bit intimidating. So what I'd like people to learn uh, you know, from, from this talk today is uh, something about aspects of Java that a lot of us are unfamiliar with. Um, and and I, I think it's the reasons that Java became successful uh, you know, in, in the beginning. Uh, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about the challenges of stewarding what is the world's most popular programming platform. And my claim is you should care about this even if you don't use Java at all for two reasons. One is we all want to be successful. And sometimes you can learn something by studying something that has been successful, even though there's always quite a bit of luck in almost any uh, success story. But also, when you're trying to build something successful, you're focusing on building the thing and getting it to work at all. You're not focusing on stewardship because you don't yet have a community or a platform to steward yet. Uh, but once you have a successful product or platform, you have to spend a lot more energy on stewardship than on the technical aspects of evolving it. And that requires a different set of skills and perspectives than you needed when you were building something new. So the constraints of evolving a mature and popular language are a lot stricter uh, than on one that has no users. Uh, and since we all want the technology we're building to be successful, in some sense, the problems that we face in evolving Java are the problems that we're all aspiring to have. So this is how you know I work at Oracle. I have to put up this, uh, this slide. So don't make any purchase decisions based on what I'm going to say. Um, so I'm going to start in you know, the deep past, uh, you know, in the early, early days before Java. So this is going to be some you know, war stories of programming with stone axes and bear skins back in the days when we had to bang ones and zeros together to keep warm. So to understand something, uh, it's, it's, it's often helpful to understand the time in which it was built. So the programming reality in the 1992-1995 time frame um, was you know, dominated largely by Fortran and C. Fortran was dominant in scientific community, uh, and C was dominant in basically everything else. Uh, there had been some uh, penetration by Pascal uh, a few years earlier. It was actually the implementation language for the original Mac OS, uh, for anybody who remember those, those old days. But even at that point, it was on the wane, and Apple was rewriting in C++. And, it hadn't always been like this. Uh, prior to this, there was this vibrant polyglot period where there were many, many languages that people used, and it was OK to use whatever language was going to work for your project. Uh, and when I started programming, it was, com it was a commonly expected. Everyone w was able to program in half a dozen languages. But the support behind C consolidated very, very quickly, largely because of its portability. And not necessarily the portability of code, because that wasn't there yet, but the portability of the compiler. And this was a big deal because there was a lot of diversity in processors, operating systems, and the cost of building a compiler for every combination of language, operator, operating system, and processor was really high. And so once C started to dominate, the network effect really kicked in, and that reinforced its dominance, and people continued to use C because of the ecosystem and talent pool and because everyone else was using it. So for me personally, and probably for a lot of people who were programming at that time, the fact that C had emerged as the winner was really quite disillusioning. I mean, I remember I took the Abelson and Sussman class at MIT in the 80s. And you know, the, the, the scheme class, the structure interpretation of computer, programming, computer programs. 
And it painted this picture of this bright, shining, computational future that I wanted to be part of. And then I got out into the real world. And it was, it was really quite a shock. And you know, to make matters worse, the C of the time was, it wasn't even that portable. There were huge differences between compilers, differences in word size. Some C compilers, zero what didn't even mean null. Uh, null was a different val numeric value. Uh, and it was hard to reuse any code because every library came with header files that were, had gar guaranteed conflict definitions like UN32 and such. So not only were we working, you know, banging ones and zeros together, uh, but it was often easier to just rewrite code from scratch than to reuse anything. And there was definitely a need for something better. We all wanted something better, but it was really hard to fight the effect of everybody uses C. So you've probably noticed technologists have a tendency to get a little bit optimistic about the next big thing. It's going to solve all our problems, whatever it is. So it's always you know, good to be mindful of what the rising hype trends are of the, you know, of the time. And you know, the, the thing to recognize is that the hype du jour, and there's always a hype of the day, uh, is almost always an over-rotation against the pain points of yesterday. Uh, so in 1992, objects were going to save the world. And it might sound funny now that object-oriented technology is, is fairly mainstream, but in 1990, the claims people made of what OO was going to do for us were just unbelievable. And by 1995, the big thing was definitely distributed objects. Distributed objects were definitely the future. And of course, the web was going to change everything. All right, well, that one actually happened. But g given all this backdrop, it shouldn't be surprising that what we got you know, with Java was distributed objects and applets. Luckily, we got some useful stuff, too. So, it's often revealing to look at the words inventors use when they describe their technology at the time it's invented. Not because this actually tells you anything about the technology, but it tells you a great deal about what the inventor thought the problem they were solving was. So Java was supposed to be a blue collar language, a language for working programmers to get their job done. And it was supposed to not be, explicitly not be, an ivory tower invention for writing perfect, beautiful code. And there was plenty of hype surrounding Java at the time. Here's, uh, this was from a paper Gosling wrote in 1995. Java is a simple object-oriented distributed interpreter, robust, scalable, architecture neutral, portable, high-performance, multi-threaded dynamic language. So buzzword complete for sure. Um, so of these buzzwords, I want to drill into a couple of them. Uh, the first one is interpreted. Now, it was never in the intent of Java to remain interpreted, but in 1995, people didn't know what virtual machine meant. So they couldn't say virtual machine-based. So in 1995, interpreted was code for virtual machine-based, as were a lot of the other buzzwords, uh, like, like secure, because the VM imposed it, interposed itself between the program and the underlying operating system. So the value of running on a virtual machine may be obvious today, but in 1995, this was pretty wild and wacky and risky stuff. Now, the other interesting one that people might find surprising is dynamic. Most people would not describe Java as a dynamic language. They would say, oh, Java's a static language. And it may be that the terms have changed a little bit over time, but the reality was always a lot more subtle than Java is static you know, and Ruby is dynamic. I think the reason you know, that this claim that Java is a dynamic language is surprising is we have this relatively limited mental model for thinking about languages being static or dynamic. We tend to think of it as a Boolean. Is this language dynamic? J you know, Java is static, Ruby dynamic. But that's really a little bit simplistic. I mean, there's really more of a spectrum, right? That some languages are more dynamic than others. Ruby is more dynamic than Java. But that's kind of simplistic also. The reality is there's a lot of different axes on which we could describe something as static uh, versus, you know, or dynamic. Static versus dynamic is the balance between what work is done at development time versus what work, work is done at runtime. And so if you think about it as there's many axes, each of one is a spectrum, and some of these axes might be typing or compilation or dispatch. And, uh, you know, we think of typing most readily when we think about st static versus dynamic languages, but there's a lot of others. When do we do compilation? When do we make dispatch decisions? When do we make linkage decisions? Can we interrogate the program at runtime you know, via reflection? Can we load classes dynamically? Can we unload classes dynamically, et cetera? So you know, if you stack it up this way, you know, Java turns out to be surprisingly dynamic. There's uh, plenty of things that happen in Java statically, like typing, but they also happen dynamically too. Java applies a type system at runtime. If you try to stick an integer in an array of strings, you're going to get an array store exception. That's dynamic typing. 
Um, you get dynamic enforcement of uh, array boundaries and null, point, null pointers. The dynamic type system is not the same type system as the static one, but they're both there, and they're each designed to catch errors that the other one might miss. Similarly, Java does its compilation statically and dynamically. Um, method overloads might be selected statically, but they're going to be dynamically linked. They're going to be uh, dynamically uh, you know, verified with a runtime type checking verifier. And we even have di dynamic enforcement of accessibility boundaries. And dynamic linkage is a really, really big deal. This is what enables us to upgrade to a new version of library by just dropping a new jar in. So you know, dynamic linkage was a, a pretty wild and radical thing at the time. Uh, we're used to it. We're used to just dropping jars in, uh, you know, in, in our class path and, and not thinking about relinking. But uh, you know, in, in 1995, this, wasn't, um, you know, this was an enormous deal. So there's a lot of other things that you know, Java does dynamically as well. We do some dynamic dispatch on the, re on the receiver type. That's uh, virtual methods. Um, you know, we support uh, reflection. And we, report, we support dynamic you know, class loading and unloading. And so on this scale, Java does look pretty dynamic with some static stuff, mostly to filter out the obviously bad programs. And a lot of these forms of dynamism did exist in 1995. You know, Unix and Windows had dynamically linked libraries for many, many years before then. But dynamic linkage had always been the exceptional path at that point. So what Java did was turn this conventional wisdom up upside down and lean much more heavily on dynamic linkage. So if you look at the features that were chosen for Java in 1995, it, it, it really can be quite confusing. It's, it's kind of an odd mix. And it might not be obvious looking back from today's perspective, but a lot of the features that we chose then, I, sh I shouldn't say we, I wasn't part of, the, part of it, but a lot of the features that were chosen then were really quite risky. Java made this enormous bet that the performance of garbage collection and dynamic compilation would improve fast enough for Java to be more than a toy. Um, you know, if you fast forward to you know, today, these bets paid off big, right? The performance of Java routinely blows away almost everything else, including um, you know, the, the static-oriented, the, you know, the statically compiled languages like C++ in a lot of cases. But in 1995, garbage collection and dynamic compilation, you know, they, were, they were academically understood technologies, but they had not yet had uh, the proven mainstream you know, industrial implementations that, that, that uh, made people trust them at the time. So building on these involved a certain amount of risk. And there were a lot of other features, too, from academic languages, ivory, ivory tower languages, such as dynamic linkage, integrated thread support, a formal memory model, an inheritance model that was neither the simplistic simple, single inheritance of Pascal nor the unrestrained uh, multiple inheritance of C++. And a lot of these did turn out to be pretty, pretty good bets, but they were risky. Uh, they hadn't been proven in languages that had gained any kind of significant traction in industry. So there's a lot of reasons we could imagine Java having failed out of the gate. Um, it's worth mentioning, by the way, that, that even some of the mistakes might have been important. Um, I mean, I love to dump on serialization. It's, it's actually my favorite thing to dump on. I think it's the worst language feature ever. But it's quite possible Java wouldn't have succeeded without it, because the transparent remoting uh, that serialization enabled uh, may very well have been part of Java's success on the server side. So the list of risky features actually keeps going on and on. Uh, there was an intense commitment to safety, uh, all sorts of runtime type checks, bound checks, pointer checks. Uh, and these are things that were definitely going against the trends of the time. We didn't know whether we could make them fast enough. Um, it really wasn't obvious whether dynamic compilers would make these costs go away. And eventually they did. Um, but, but the really interesting thing is, if, is you, all of these really risky things are balanced by this almost Luddite undercurrent of, we don't need that when it comes to the programming model. There were all these features you know, from C and C++, like operator overloading and multiple inheritance, and lower level features like structs and macros and function pointers, or even pointers at all, that you know, were eliminated from the programming model. So there's this very strange grab bag of all of this weird, risky stuff from ag academic languages. And then all of this really boring, conservative, you know, we don't need that. So at this point, you, know, you might wonder, was James just smoking something? I mean, he was kind of a hippie. He could have been. But it, 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 it does seem a little bit incongruous with the claims of this is a blue collar language. It does look a little bit like kind of a random walk through the design space. Um, so you have this claim, we're not an ivory tower language, but then you have all these features taken from ivory tower languages. Um, 
Now, if you look a little bit closer, it um, starts to make a little bit more sense. Uh, the, um, the risky stuff is all in the VM. It's all under the waterline where the programmers don't interact with it. It's, it's just stuff that makes the runtime better. And all the we don't need that stuff is up there in the user visible programming model you know, that we interact with every day. And this wasn't an accident. So when I asked James about this, uh, he gave me this wonderful quote, which was, it was clear from talking to customers, they all needed garbage collection and dynamic compilation and dynamic linkage and threading and all sorts of things that always came wrapped in languages that scared them. So the reality is, you know, Java as a language, when, when you consider the language and the VM together, had more in common with languages like Lisp or Smalltalk or Mesa or other scary languages than it did C or C++. But it looked enough like C that people were comfortable with it. Um, and so James described this as a wolf in sheep's clothing. People thought they wanted C, but they really needed features of languages that scared them away. So he gave them the features they needed in a language that looked like what they wanted. And it worked. It was like the mother of all Jedi mind tricks. You know, this is the programming language you're looking for. It was beautiful. And there's a lesson there that we can learn from, which is if you want to get a broad audience to raise up their programming game, don't do it by scaring them. Do it by making them comfortable. And you know, I, I, I suspect there are some people in this room who are interested in moving uh, the world of programmers more towards functional programming idioms, right? And anybody meet that description? OK, so there's a lesson here. Don't scare people, right? Don't tell people, oh, monad monads aren't as scary as they look. I mean, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctures. What's so hard about that? Wrong. Don't say monad. It scares people. OK, so this trick was like fantastically successful. Um, it's worth admitting that Java kind of missed its first few targets. Originally, it was aimed at set-top boxes and actually has been pretty successful there. It's baked into the Blu-ray standard. But if it were just for set-top boxes, we wouldn't be here talking about it. Well, well you'd probably be here. I, I probably wouldn't be here talking about it. Um, and then sort of as the hype at the, about the web fired up, Java rotated to the client and, well, missed there as well. Uh, but where it did stick, and which no one saw coming in 1995, was on the server side. So even though there were definitely a few missteps along the way, uh, you know, the, uh, the Java managed to luck into a market that it, uh, that it worked well for. And looking back, the reasons it succeeded, I think, had mostly to do with the features that JVM offered for building reliable software. Fast garbage collection, dynamic compilation, reliable concurrency, safety, dynamic linkage, and a language that wasn't too scary to program in. And these factors made for a very framework-friendly platform, which was a key factor in Java's initial success on the server side. So I'll just say again, though, that you, know, you had to fool a few people somewhat to get them to adopt a programming language that was actually going to be good for them. People thought they wanted something like C, but really they needed capabilities from languages that on the surface were scary to them. So a significant aspect of Java's success here was being able to separate what people thought they wanted from what they actually wanted. And I'll admit this is a really hard trick to pull off. There's, there's no, no, no question about that. All right, so let's um, skip forward a little bit to where Java is uh, today. So I promise this is the only pure marketing slide in the deck here. Uh, Java today is arguably the world's most popular programming language and the world's most popular deployment platform with a community o over 9 million developers. And I don't bring this up to boast. I, I bring this up because being successful in this way places some, some constraints on us that other platforms don't have. Now, we can't just stand still. That's a recipe for guaranteed irrelevance. We need to evolve carefully because even the smallest change could break someone's mission critical code. So let's look at some of the constraints uh, that this success imposes on how we evolve the platform and how we deal with that. One way to think about it is to imagine Java were a country. So what country would it be? Well, we'll start with uh, the numbers we know, population 9 million. OK, Let, let's assume that that 9 million is a complete lie made up by Oracle's marketing department. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll use that to estimate what the GDP of the country of Java might be. So let's assume that of those 9 million, 5% uh, are employed as developers in, um, developing, in developed uh, countries. And maybe twice that, 10% are employed as developers in developing nations. So 
went online, found some loaded salary estimate numbers, came up with a net personal income number for the country of Java. Then I went to the, the US Census, and I got the ratio of net personal income to GDP. And I came up with a number of um, between two and $300 billion for the GDP of the country of Java. That's pretty good. All right, well, what country does this resemble? Um, well, actually, a pretty good comparison, Sweden. Population comparable, GDP fairly comparable, and you know we even have pretty similar mascots. <laughs> so OK, there's a lot of Swedish guys on my team, so I have to tweak them a little bit. Uh, all right, so silliness aside, um, there's a point here. And that, that point is, steering Java is not all that different from the task of steering a country. You know, just like in any country, there are going to be a lot of separate interests that need to be balanced, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of separate opinions, and you know, you know, you're never able to move quite as fast as you'd like to because you know, there isn't a uniformity of opinion about what the right thing to do is. So the biggest question that any society grapples with is how much and how fast to change. And there's this constant tension. The world changes around us, and we have to respond to that change. Um, otherwise, we become irrelevant. But if we change too fast, we risk losing, you know, losing touch with the principles and customers you know, that got us where we are. So there are these forces that push us towards change. We have to uh, keep up with the changing reality around us, changing hardware reality, changing demographics, changing fashions. And also, you know, we want to fix some of the inevitable mistakes we made along the way. Um, on the other hand, there are some forces that resist change. Uh, so, you know, in, in our community, we have a very low tolerance for making incompatible changes. We don't want to buy into fashion of the week uh, because that risks alienating loyal users who might like things perfectly well the way they are. And just like in politics, it's possible to be hated from both sides, right? Because one side thinks you're, you know, moving too fast, and the other side thinks you're not moving fast enough. And that's kind of, you know, how you know that you're like mostly in the right. You know, when you're equally hated from the left and the right, you're probably, you know, in pretty good shape. So, if you want to not alienate your core users, it's a good idea to have some principles. Um, so, the Java language, while being pretty minimal, is actually driven by a pretty reasonable set of principles. Um, and these are principles we've gone back to over and over again as we've evolved the language. Uh, so, these principles were enumerated by Graham Hamilton, who was sort of the steward for Java for uh, its first 10 years. And they've done pretty well for us uh, so far. So, the most important one is the first one, which is reading code is more important than writing code. I'm always amazed that how many developers don't even get this today. Right? Code is written once, but it's read many times. When we're writing code, it has our full attention. When we're reading code, we're, our attention is generally elsewhere. We're trying to track down some bug. We're trying to figure out what's going on in some you know, other, other part of the code that might only be tangentially related to the code we're looking at now. So the, given that we read code more often than we write it, the easier it is to read, the more successful our interactions with it are going to be. Um, Sim, you know, as a supporting, a supporting virtue here, simplicity matters. If you make things simple, they're, they're going to be simple to understand. And the last of these principles is about transparency. Code should do what it looks like it does. If you see code that says x equals 3, you shouldn't have to reason about has you know, the equals operator been overloaded. You should you know, you look at this and say, I know what that code does without having to look at the, the whole world. Uh, so features like operator overloading and macros make it harder uh, you know, for you to look at code and, and know exactly you know, what it does. And that's why they were left out. So um, yesterday, in, in, in Joel's keynote, he talked about um, how you keep a community nice, right? And how you know, the, the, the Wikipedia editors and um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, Linus in the Linux kernel uh, has a role to keep you know, bad stuff out and sometimes is, um, you know, can make themselves unpopular uh, as, as a result. So you may have had you know, this experience in the Java community of advocating for a language feature or a library feature and having your great idea met with a mystifyingly cold reception. The reality is we have to say no to almost anything. Uh, if we didn't, things would pretty you know, quickly degenerate to the point where the system collapsed under its own weight. And people complain about, why didn't you take back my patch? After all, I, I did all the work. I gave, I gave it to you. All you had to do was take it in. Well, from our perspective, um, it doesn't, you know, th that doesn't look like all the work has been done. In fact, we tend to look at it from the opposite perspective. If someone hands us a patch, we tend to look at that as being the first 0% of the work. 
all of the really hard work is in the stewardship, uh, imagining all the possible interactions with other features and with future features and reasoning about the consequences of, well, if we did this, which of these 18 possible futures might we foreclose on? And might we want to leave those possibilities open at the, uh, the cost of saying no to this thing here? Um, you know, look, looking at, you know, people say, well, if you added this language feature, you'd be able to write, you know, this code, which I want to write. And you have to ask your question, ask the question of, well, what other code would it enable that we don't want you to write? So, you know, th there's, um, the, the, just saying, I've implemented here, take it, is a very small part of the work. All the hard work is in the stewardship. Um, and of course, we have to you know, think about how this balances across all the users, not just the advocate for one particular feature, and whether that aggregate balance is beneficial or detrimental. And this you know, is pretty hard to see from the outside, so I can totally imagine why we come across, look, across looking like a bunch of self-important jerks, but you know, I guess I've gotten used to that, so. All right, so uh, let's look at where things stood a few years ago when we were planning Java 8. Um, the reality is about five years ago, um, Sun was working very hard to go out of business. And you know, it would not have been unreasonable for you know, people who have been programming in Java for a long time to have concluded that, well, Java was pretty much done for. It was you know, old man's programming language, wasn't going anywhere. It was like you know, uh, yesterday's thing. And you know, I totally understand how uh, one could feel that way. I kind of felt that way when I got to Sun and was hoping to be part of the solution there. Uh, it took a little bit longer than you know, then I hoped it would, but, but ultimately, ultimately uh, things did get better. Um, but okay, so you know, five years ago, it's clear the language is looking pretty old. Developers had more choices than they had previously. There were um, some good languages uh, you know, that uh, had you know, developed um, you know, in the time that, uh, you know, that, that, that Java was around. Some of them even ran on the JVM. And we definitely had to keep up with uh, increased productivity ex expectations from developers. Um, even though within the community there was plenty of disagreements about how much change would be enough or too much, and you know whatever we did was going to make someone unhappy, um, but we also you know had to remain relevant with respect to today's hardware reality. And one key challenge we faced was finding a better programming model that supports both sequential and parallel execution while at the same time still looking like Java. So we took this as sort of one of the central challenges for the uh, the, the features that we added in um, you know Java 8 for the language and libraries. Okay, so let's look at the features we actually chose to implement for Java 8. Uh, it's a um, pretty short list, actually. Lambda expressions, a whole bunch of type inference, uh, mechanism for evolving APIs over time, and some library support for aggregate and data parallel operations on collections. Now, a lot of the ideas here, like Lambda expressions, are obvious to anyone who has used other languages, so the features themselves aren't really the new story. The interesting story is, how did we deal with the constraints of doing these things and having the results still feel like Java? Um, and of course, one way to do that is to do fewer features and pick them carefully, um, you know, and hopefully you pick the right ones. Um, in a sense, all the features on this list are a consequence of having made the choice to support Lambda expressions. Um, interestingly, the single largest uh, part of the work had to do with um, overhauling the interaction of two features that nobody even notices, uh, method overload resolution and type inference. Uh, and these were needed to support using lambdas in a natural way. Uh, so these are features that have like almost no surface area at all, other than the ability to write the obvious code and have it work the way you expect. And um, the only time you even notice these features is when something goes wrong and you get an incomprehensible error message from the compiler. So when people ask, why did Java 8 take so long? Uh, a big part of the answer was, well, this is why, making it work seamlessly. Um, second biggest and most unfortunate part of the work was the interaction with my favorite feature, serialization. Uh, serialization is definitely the, the gift that keeps on giving. It interacts with every new language feature. And we tried so hard to put, to put our heads in the sand and say, no, 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 we don't have to support serialization. But, but we did. Um, and we, you know, we, so we took this work on not because we thought it was a good idea, because we knew it was a terrible idea. But if we didn't, things would have looked nailed on the side, and that would be even worse. Okay. So most of the people in this room already know what a Lambda expression is, uh, except there's a few managers. Just close your eyes for the next few slides, managers. Um, a, a Lambda expression is just, it's an anonymous method, right? It, it's, uh, the key point here is it's finally time, or past time, or well past time, for Java to have them, because everyone else already does. And you know, the key aspect of, of Lambdas that we care about is that they enable us to treat behavior as data. 
So the interesting part of the story is how uh, is, is not the language feature itself, but how it changes the nature of the libraries that we're going to write. So libraries have always been a big part of Java's strength. Um, you know, they're you know language features like Lambda. They're not a goal unto themselves. They're an enabler, right? They're a means to an end. Uh, so one of you know one of the things that they enable is the development of more effective libraries. So that's not really a goal either, though. The real goal is we want people to write better code, right? We want to make it easier for developers to write simpler, more expressive, easier to read, less error-prone code. Um, and you know, if that new improved code happens to be more easily parallelized, well, so much the better. OK, so uh, just a couple of code slides, quick before and after. Uh, again, apologies to the non-coders in the room. Um, so developers could always model code as, as code behavior as data using anonymous classes. This enabled us to write libraries that abstracted over behavior, sort of, but they were kind of painful to use. So I'll just take a quick example. Imagine you want to have some method to remove all the elements from a collection that match such some criteria, right? So what do you do? You do the same thing you always do. You model the criteria with an interface. So I have this interface predicate, has a method test. And then I write some method that says, uh, that takes a collection and a predicate and removes all the elements that match that predicate. And here we're abstracting over both the type of the element in the collection and the specific you know, removal criteria, like remove all the people who are over 18, or remove all the flesh-eating zombies, or, or, or whatever. And that's good as far as it goes, except where you know, the, um, the rubber meets the road, where the user actually has to use it, the code is really quite ugly. Um, and the user has to use an anonymous class to express the criteria, and it's easy for the intent to get lost in the syntactic noise. And the real problem with this is when something is unpleasant, people avoid doing it. So as a result, we didn't write APIs like this because using them was too painful. But you know, the reality is most of the syntax associated with inner classes is really just boilerplate. Um, so if we had a better way of writing down this little bit of behavior, and obviously you know where this is going, we replace this with a lambda expression, you know, the meaning of our code becomes a lot clearer. Take the, you know, remove all the people from the collection uh, that match the criteria, you know, person.age is greater than 18. Um, so, you know, in this case, you know, the lambda expression stands in as an anonymous method. It has an argument list. It has a body. It has all the same things that, uh, that, you know, that a method does. It just has less syntactic weight. And it does the same thing that the anonymous instance did before. Um, so obviously one aspect, but certainly not the only aspect, uh, is that they're syntactically more compact than their classes. And that's nice. Um, you know, but the real payoff is how it changes the way we program. Uh, because if this changes the APIs we're willing to use, that means it has a chance to change the APIs we're inclined to write. So what starts out as a quantitative decrease in pain actually turns into a qualitative change in the APIs we end up actually writing and using. And uh, if, uh, for, for those who you know, were at my talk yesterday, uh, I went through a lot of details about how Lambdas are not just syntactic sugar for inner classes. Uh, the implementation is actually completely different, and there's a lot of interesting VM work that went on that makes them faster than inner classes as well. OK, brief note on syntax. There's no such thing as brief note on syntax, but I'll, I'll, I'll try. Uh, the syntax we chose is basically the same from C Sharp or Scala. Uh, this wasn't for lack of creativity. Uh, there were endless, endless arguments over syntax. There were dozens of alternatives proposed. And in the end, we decided to go with what was shown to work in similar languages, um, you know, even though uh, we were certainly, you know, there, there was no shortage of creative new ideas for doing it a new way. Sometimes good stewardship just means doing the boring thing. OK, so here's the interesting part. When we replaced the anonymous class instance with a lambda, you notice the API for remove all didn't change. OK, this is really powerful. This is an example of how having billions of lines of code out there is going to affect your decisions and may push you to take a decision that uh, might be different from the obvious one. Um, you know, we could have added function types to the type system, and in a lot of ways, that was the obvious thing to do. It also turned out to be the wrong thing to do, because if we had done that, we cer certainly, well, we would have been stuck with a number, of, um, a, a number of consequences of how we would have had to implement them. They probably would have been erased, which would have been awful. Um, but by leveraging a pattern that people were already using, which is these one method interfaces to define a function, which we've been doing in Java for years, runnable, comparator, you know, callable, et cetera, 
we immediately gained forward compatibility with libraries that were written 15 years ago that never imagined lambdas. But because they used this pattern, which was a common pattern, all of these libraries that we wrote 10, 15 years ago are immediately lambda ready. And this avoided a really painful transition that we could have had and that we kind of did have with generics, which is, you know, if we had done function types in Java, we would have bifurcated the world of Java libraries into old libraries and new libraries. And we would have spent the next five years dealing with the, I'm trying to use an old library and a new library and, you know, lobbying to migrate one library it would have been a big waste of effort. So, uh, you know, by doing something simpler in the language, uh, we are able to leverage the work that has gone on in the community over the years and have these old libraries become immediately useful. So that was a big deal. Okay, so still, good, it's a good story, but why did it take so long? I mean, we knew four years ago what idioms we wanted to support. We knew what a lambda was. The time-consuming part was making it seamless. And you know, like I said earlier, the, the biggest component of this was overhauling type inference and overload selection to work together in a way that, was, um, you know, that, that let us write the simple code that we wanted to write. Um, so this is mostly under the waterline for the perspective of most users. Um, you know, they, they think, you know, okay, the big new feature is Lambda, but without this big overhaul to overload selection and type inference, it would definitely have felt nailed on. And I'll, I'll, gi I'll give you uh, sort of an example of what I'm talking about. We have this remove all method, right? Its argument is a Lambda. We haven't given the type of the, um, the argument to the Lambda. It's, we just called it P. The compiler is supposed to infer that it's a person. How does it infer that? It infers that from the signature of remove all. Okay, so in order to infer the types of an arguments th the arguments to the method, we have to know the method, sig method signature. But we can't do method overload selection until we know the types of the arguments, because the types of the arguments is the input to method overload selection. So you have this circularity here, and if we had just done the naive thing, it would have been very ugly. It all turns out to work, but we had to really turn things on their head and rebuild it in order to make it work, of course, without breaking any existing code. So that, that was actually pretty cool, but uh, you know, no one actually gets to see that because it just works. Okay, so we talked about the, how this affects the kind of libraries we actually write. Um, so um, let, let me give a couple examples here. Um, so you know, we integrated a, a bunch of new features into the collection library. Uh, so here's an example of doing a query over a collection to take a list of people and find the weight of the, the heaviest guy. And I'm sure this looks familiar to you because if you write in you know, Ruby or Python or JavaScript, you, know, you can write this code today. So you're saying, okay, what's the big deal? We've had this for 15 years, right? Um, so you know, we actually could have written libraries like this in Java years ago, but like no sane person would use them because they'd be too painful to use. You'd have these enormous anonymous classes everywhere and your code would be unreadable. Okay, so you know, there's, a, there's a bonus here though, um, that having recast this computation in a more functional style, parallelism gets a lot easier because we've inverted the control of the, uh, of, of the operation. It used to be the client was in control of iteration, asking an iterator for the next element each time, and now we've let the library be in control and that means the library can, um, you know, can, can decide, or we could ask it, to execute in parallel. So uh, to turn this computation into a parallel computation, all I have to do is say, instead of give me a stream of values from the collection, give me a parallel stream of values for the collection. Now, again, we've been able to express parallel computations in Java for a long time. We've had a fork join framework since Java 7. It was available in open source before then. But the code to express this computation in parallel with fork join would look nothing like the sequential version. It would be a lot more painful to write and wouldn't even fit on a slide. Um, and you know, it, that puts a hurdle in front of developers who are trying to go parallel. So if you frame the computation correctly, you can express the serial and parallel versions in pretty much the same code and not get distracted by the accidental complexity of the implementation details. Uh, this reduces errors. When the code looks more like the problem statement, it's more likely to be right. So it's really all about helping people write code that's so obviously correct that you know, bugs are not gonna be lurking. Um, so you know, as 
I've noted the library I just showed you is you know, no means original. You can see similar examples in lots of other languages. Uh, but we, you know, where we did really move the ball forward here is how, how we integrate parallelism. And uh, just to give you um, a, a little peek of where we got some of our inspiration from, has anybody seen this talk? Uh, this was Guy's, Guy Steele's keynote at Strange Loop from three years ago, how to think about parallel programming, not. Has anybody seen this? OK, everybody write this down. Uh, go watch this tonight. It, it's unbelievable. This is one of the best talks I've ever seen. Uh, so this is wh where we got a lot of our inspiration. And I'm only going to show you three of his slides. I'm not going to do the whole thing here, obviously. Uh, but the, the simple question that he asks is, what kind of code would we like to be able to write to get a computation that parallelizes cleanly? So he gives the classic example of, here's the computation tree that arises from a for loop. This language happens to be Fortran, but it works the same way in C or Java or whatever. You get a heavily left balanced computation tree where um, you basically have to do everything sequentially. And the question that Guy asked is, what kind of code do we want to write to get this computation tree? Um, and you know, at, at, at the time, uh, we didn't really have an answer for that, but I think we actually do have a pretty nice answer now. And uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with where it, ended, where it ended up. But please do, go, go, see, go watch Guy's talk. OK, so again, the code looks really simple. Other languages have been doing this for years. So well, why did this take so long? So again, obvious from day one, we wanted to be able to do MapReduce on collections. Um, so all right, what took the other two years? Well, the devil's in the details. So we wanted a lot of flexibility and performance. We wanted to make it feel baked in. And doing all that work under the surface takes a lot of time. So for example, um, we, uh, we introduced an abstraction uh, that's basically a generalization of iterator. Uh, of, of, of iterator, we call it splitterator because it combines iterating and splitting. Splitting is what you need to do parallel recursive decomposition. Uh, so we created this new splitterator abstraction, and we retrofitted all the collections in the JDK with good splitterator implementations so that you could do parallel operations on them. Uh, we also wrote splitterators for things like arrays and uh, I.O. channels and generator functions and various other things so that if you have any way of generating a, a stream of elements, you can do a parallel operation on it. And then we implemented all of these operations so that they can work in parallel against any source, because they're all implemented in terms of this abstract splitterator thing. And here's, the, here's where it gets really cool. If you look at this computation, you might think we're doing three passes on the data. First we do filtering, then we do mapping, and then we do reduction. You might think that there are intermediate collections lurking behind the surface of you know, take, take the filtered elements, stick them in an intermediate uh, you know, uh, collection, because that's probably what we would you know, uh, do if we were writing it by hand. Uh, the reality is the library is only making a single pass on the data, whether sequentially or in parallel. The library fuses all the operations together into a single pass. Um, and actually, in some cases, this is faster than the comparable for loop. Uh, it's pretty surprising, but it is. Um, and again, the user doesn't have to think about those details. And then um, you know, to, to top it off, uh, we actually keep track of information that's hidden from the surface API, but that comes in from the, the splitterator of the underlying collection of what we know about the, the, the source, like whether we know the thing has a size or not. We know it may have known splitting characteristics. We may know that the elements are unique or sorted or whatever. And then we use that to optimize execution of the pipeline. So for example, if you have a pipeline that says, um, you know, uh, people.stream.filter.sorted.foreach, and it turns out people was a sorted collection. It doesn't even bother uh, doing the sort. It knows the, the elements are already sorted. So yes, this code looks a lot like code that you could write in other languages, but it goes an awful lot deeper. There's a lot of optimization uh, you know, that goes on. There's parallelism baked in. And you, know, you can do a parallel MapReduce query on a non-thread safe array list without changing data structures. Same array list you've been using for, you know, for, for 17 years you can do parallel, parallel operations on without having to change data structures. Pretty cool. OK, so that's cool. Um, but honestly, the imperative version of the find the heaviest guy code wouldn't have been too ugly either, right? Wouldn't have been that much longer than the, uh, than the code that I wrote. So why do we care? The real issue is the imperative approach just doesn't scale well as the code gets more complex. So if you want to take a more complex query like, uh, find me the transactions to a buyer over 65 and print the corresponding sellers sorted by name. 
if you, did, if you write this in the obvious way, there's a lot of accidental detail, right? So this is like typical idiomatic Java code uh, to implement the query I just gave you. Although if I said, you know, okay, quick, you have five seconds, tell me what this code does, you probably couldn't because you'd still be halfway through reading because there's all this mess in the way, all this accidental complexity in the way. So if we recast this as an aggregate operation using the, uh, the stream library, the code becomes a lot more clear. It starts to read like the problem statement, and therefore it's more likely to be correct because it's easier to see what's going on, and you get free parallelism without having to rewrite your code if you want it. So by up-leveling the computation to operate on the data set instead of individual elements, uh, it, it sort of brings the problem to the surface. We're focusing on the what of the operation, not the how. The code reads like the problem statement. Um, it's not about uh, the extraneous details anymore, like I'm using a sorted set here. It's just what am I doing to the data, and it's actually really fast. So this is kind of um, where we took a page from history again. We pulled you know, James Wolf and Sheep's clothing trick. You know, Everybody thinks that lambdas are just another language feature, but in reality, they're an enabler for a more functional style of programming in Java, but without being too pushy, right? We're not turning Java into Scala or, or Haskell, where, where you, know, you can still do all the imperative, mutative stuff you might want to do, but hopefully, over time, developers will realize that the functional idioms offer them some value, and they'll migrate to them. So you know, the way I like to think about this is, if you want people to do the right thing, make the path of least resistance lead to the right thing. And then people's natural laziness will do the work for you. Right? So you know, Joel was talking you know, uh, yesterday about um, you know, trying to keep the bad actors out of the community. Right? And you have to do that. You need some amount of stick. But you know, much better if you can just make the, the path of least resistance lead to the result you want. Right? And you know, we don't even use the word functional in, in describing uh, you know, these features in Java. You know, it, it's, uh, in fact, the joke around the office is, don't say the F word, it scares the children. <laughs> uh, you know, and you know, some of you may have like, discovered this. Right? Selling mainstream users on functional programming is a hard sell, because it comes with scary words like monad and catamorphism. And, and requiring that people buy into a religion before adopting the tools is a recipe for slow adoption. Um, so instead, you know, I'd rather offer people you know, a powerful tool for streamlining their business logic and hope that as a side effect, they learn that programming without side effects is, uh, is better. Um, so you know, what we care about is helping people get to cleaner, more maintainable code. A colleague once asked me, why do you bother with Java? Why don't you go work on Clojure or something? And I have to say, you know, working on Clojure would be cool. Uh, but the reason I work on Java is there's leverage here. I've got nine million developers, and if I can help them all program even just a few percent better, that's going to have a big effect on the way the world programs. And that's, that's a noble cause. OK, so um, one other feature that we added in Java 8, default methods. Uh, this is a feature that addresses another problem that new languages don't have, which is how do you compatibly evolve old APIs? So when your language is new, so are your APIs, right? And you're probably not thinking about, well, what's going to happen in 10 years? Because you're still wondering whether people are going to buy it at all. And you're happy to say, well, I'll worry about that in 10 years. And you know, if you're lucky, 10 years comes and goes pretty fast. And you know, we discovered that interfaces in Java are this you know, uh, really a, a two-edged sword. On the one hand, they make these strong contract guarantees. But on the other, you can't add new methods to old interfaces without breaking the implementation. And that's not a problem in year one or two or three, but after 15 years, it became a big problem. And if we were designing our collections today with lambdas, they certainly wouldn't look like they do now. So the perverse result is, by adding lambdas to the language, our old collections look even older. Well, that's a great reward for all this work, right? So, the, but the collections APIs are so deeply embedded in the billions of lines of Java code out there that we can't ask people to migrate to new collections. So we needed a mechanism to evolve interfaces over time. The idea is pretty straightforward. We can compatibly add a new virtual method to an interface as long as the interface itself provides a default implementation. And here's an example of the stream method that we saw on collections. It uh, has a pretty simple implementation, but it's a fully virtual method, so you can override it. So ArrayList can have a better implementation of, uh, of, of its stream method, and, and the ArrayList in the JDK does, in fact. Um, now, again, this is something that wouldn't be possible if it weren't for dynamic linkage, because we're invoking a method on a class that didn't exist at the time the class was written. Pretty cool. Uh, that dynamic linkage trick, that was a really clever idea. 
James is a smart guy. Um, so uh, this is a little bit similar to, but different from extension methods in C sharp. Uh, C sharp extension methods are uh, static, not virtual. Uh, so we we kind of like that you can override these things and provide better implementations. And a client can't even tell that this method isn't a f you know full fledged member of the interface or different from any other interface method. Um, and as sort of a bonus, even though the primary goal here was uh, interface evolution, it just so happens that with this, interfaces become more like stateless traits. Don't tell anyone, it's a secret. Um, so yeah, they're okay, they're not quite as powerful as Scala's traits, but um, it does add an awful lot of power while being a small deviation from where the language is now and remaining compatible with billions of lines of code. Okay, so, the set of features that we could have added to Java is enormous. We have a database full of RFEs that we're never going to implement, right? Uh, but it's not about number of features. It's about what those features enable. Um, and the hard part, and the reason it took three years or six years or 15 years, depending on how you want to count, was fitting it in so that it looked like it belonged and working through all the interactions with all the features that came before it. But the lesson is, with enough effort, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And with the leverage of nine million developers, it's worth making that effort. OK, so I want to take a very brief look into where Java is going next. Um, so you know, again, legal disclaimer slide. I, I really do work at Oracle. Not lying. Uh, OK, so the obvious question you would ask is, all right, so we're done, right? Anything left to do? And you know, or maybe we just like wrap a pretty ribbon on it, call it done. Well. OK, uh, how many people here think there might still be a few pain points left in Java? OK, good. Full employment guaranteed. <laughs> so you know, we want to systematically address these. Um, and you know, uh, we, we kind of did a, an inventory of what are the big pain points that Java developers face. Um, and a lot of them have to do with how objects are represented. So for example, uh, boxing you know, primitives into objects when you want to put them into collections, ugh. Where are my tuples? I want tuples. Uh, why are we still living with erasure? Why can't I generify over primitives? Um, and you know, Java gives us this great mechanism for abstracting over data, but it gives us a performance cost, which is if I create an abstract data type, now I have an indirection to get to the data of that. And that kind of pointer chasing is a big source of performance issues. And you know, arrays have all kinds of ongoing limitations. They're only, it can be indexed with 32-bit ints. Uh, you can't make them immutable. You can't easily implement sparse arrays or heterogeneous arrays. Um, and on top of that, you know, we also have some other targets we might want to uh, run efficiently on, like GPUs and FPGAs. So you know, there's um, lambdas are a pretty good first step towards uh, a number of these goals, um, spe especially you know G GPUs. But you know, there's there's an awful lot more. Now, the underlying problem behind most of these pain points is uh, what you might call Java's overdeveloped sense of identity. Every, everything's an object. Every object has an identity, whether you want it or not. Um, so we have this runtime type system where there's, uh, you have uh, objects, which are aggregate, homo heterogeneous aggregates with identity, arrays, which are homogeneous aggregates with identity, and then just a very small number of magic types like int that you can actually work with efficiently. You, know, you can um, stuff them into registers and uh, uh, you know, or, or stuff them you know, neatly into arrays. You can push them on the stack. Uh, but you can't uh, still put them into type variables, unfortunately. And there's no way to make new primitive types, right? So if you want to make a type for complex or for decimal or uh, you know, pair, um, you're kind of out of luck uh, unless you're willing to pay the abstraction cost that objects give you. Um, and there's lots of times when we only care about the data and not the identity of the box that comes in. And of course, it probably would have been easier if we had dealt with this from the beginning rather than retrofitting it afterwards. But you know uh, that's where we are. And so the question is, well, what are we going to do about it? So you know, the, um, the next big target that we're working on, um, and I'm not going um, to use a version number uh, you know, associated with it. We're working on it. When it's ready, we'll, we'll announce when it's going to be available, uh, is value types, which is they're like classes, 
uh, but they don't have identity. That means they don't need an object header. They can be readily stored um, in, uh, in fields or store, uh, sorry, in registers or pushed on the stack. They can be flattened into other objects uh, so we get rid of some of the dereferences. And this is a key enabler for all kinds of really useful things like tuples or records or better numeric types like complex or decimal or um, you know, efficient cursors uh, or algebraic data types like you know, optional or choice or just you know, user-defined primitives like 128-bit you know, unsigned int or, or things like that. Um, and of course, in order to use these effectively, we need to uh, address the limitations of generics as well. So we're working on this. Uh, these are, you know, this work is still in the early stages, uh, but you know, it underlies a lot of big ticket features, but it's a big target, big cost, big return. Um, so uh, we're gonna start with how does this work in the VM, and then work upwards, surfacing it in the language. Okay, so wrapping up. Um, five years ago, people thought Java was basically dead. Um, you know, and that was you know, not an unreasonable conclusion based on you know, the, the evidence of the time and the energy that Sun was putting into it. Uh, and over the last two years, I think we've demonstrated that it's uh, possible to achieve significant modernization without compromising your principles and without compromising your uh, compatibility and we plan to keep on doing just that. So I thank you very much, and I think we have a few minutes for questions, do we? Okay. So if you raise your hand, um, Brian's gonna point to who we're gonna go to first. All right, how about there? So what's the projected publication date for Java concurrency in practice? you know, leveraging Java 8? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I have, I've, I've been meaning to work on an update of the book for a long time. There's lots of good new stuff to work on. Um, I haven't started yet. I'm hoping to find some time this summer to start writing again. But, you know, no promises. Oh, let me pull up my disclaimer slide. Yeah, uh, wait, where is it? There we go, see? All right, disclaimer slide. Any other questions? Question over here. Get my workout. What's in it for Oracle to keep you guys around, and are they going to continue to do so? Ah, oh, what a wonderful softball question. Did Oracle pay you to ask that question? <laughs> Excellent. All right. Why does Oracle invest in the Java community? It's a really easy answer. Oracle's a very easy company to understand. We love money. So all you have to do is figure out why something is in Oracle's greedy self-interest, and you can understand why, why they would do it. So it is totally in Oracle's self-interest for Java to remain vibrant. We have billions of lines of Java code. We have tens of billions of dollars a year in revenue from Java-based products. We employ 10 to 15,000 Java developers. If Java were to become irrelevant, we wouldn't be able to hire new developers, we would have to pay a lot of money to retrain those developers, we would have to rewrite billions of lines of code, much better to make sure that Java remains a productive platform for development. And if it happens to benefit the rest of the world, collateral damage. <laughs> no, seriously, it's totally in Oracle's financial interest for Java to remain the, you know, uh, a vibrant programming platform, and you know, there's, there's no ulterior motive here. Uh, well, time for one more. Okay, All thank right. you, Brian. Thank you very much.